firstly, I have not been informed of this, so let me just clarify how long do I have exactly for the talk? As long as you wish. As long as I wish, okay. I'm going to make you regret that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, um, last week we began our discussion on uh, the book uh, Islamic Thought System from uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, and we went through the climate uh, in which those speeches were given. Uh, we saw uh, the pressures which existed in the society at that time. We said it was five years before the Islamic Revolution took place. Um, and we said that the environment was so strangling that um, discussions on Islam were in and of themselves a kind of form of rebellion. Uh, we said people would be arguing, like groups and institutions would be arguing because they would be afraid to spread even the translations of uh, the Qur'an, let alone going through the tafsir of the Qur'an. Um, but he took this step. Um, and uh, inshallah today we will get to the introduction of the book itself, and which he himself had written. So it would explain better why he decided to do what he did. And you can almost sense there's a, there's a tone of frustration in why he did it. It's like, like, how bad has the situation become? How bad has the situation become? I have to do something, right? And you see it in the tone, which is, um, which is there in the introduction itself. So he says, he begins the introduction by saying one of the main needs of the society at that time was that the Islamic belief system it had to be explained properly. Right? If he's saying that the Islamic belief system had to be explained properly, that means there were some problems in the explanations that were there at that time. And he recognizes three problems which existed. And again, as we start the book itself, you see how he takes care within his explanations of Islam for those three problems not to be there. So the first thing he mentions is that the first thing he mentions is that um, in the current explanations of Islam at that time, Islam was something which just existed in the realm of theory. It just existed in the minds. Right? So I can prove to you, as they say in England, I can prove to you till the cows come home that God exists, or there's only one God, for example. But how does that have any effect on my life? How does that affect me in my day-to-day -day life? Again, remember the climate this was in. There were two strands which were trying to bring about the revolution. One was the communist movement and the other one was the Islamic movement. And one of the issues that the communists had with religion in general and more specifically with Islam at that time was how is this thing that you're talking about in your mosques and stuff, which purely is like theoretical dis uh, discussions, how is that going to help us bring about change in the society? How does that have any impact on our day-to-day -day life? Right? So when Islam was being presented at that time, it was purely something which exists in the mind. It's like you would come uh, in your center and the discussion of that day would be, what is the material of the plates and cups you'll be eating and drinking from in heaven? Right? Speak an hour about that. You step outside and you may get arrested. You may get shot. So within the center, it's like that. And as soon as you step outside, it's like a completely different reality. It's like religion kind of made this bubble in which you could think everything is okay. But then when you would move out, it's like, no, this is the reality. So there were two different things when this is definitely not the case. This is not what Islam is supposed to be. So he says the first problem was this, that the current explanations of Islam were um, not showing people how Islam, the theoretical concepts of Islam, have an effect on the day-to-day -day lives. The second issue that he saw was that Islam, in reality, is a body made up of different parts that work efficiently with each other, right? A body made up of different parts that work efficiently with each other. 
However, how was it being presented? It was as if this body was being dissected, it was cut up into different pieces, and then if I want to explain Islam to you, I would take one piece and I'd throw it at you. Say, here you go, Islam, right? The example is that of a car, right? I want to explain to you what a car is. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up this car and I'll take the steering wheel and I'll throw it at you. It's like, here you go, here's a car. It's like, okay, how much of that car would you actually understand? Right? You take the seat, you throw the seat. It's like, yeah, this, this is a car. Right? How much of Islam do you actually understand? Right? Islam has fiqh, Christianity has fiqh. Islam has spirituality, Christianity has spirituality. Islam has its historical discussions, Christianity has its historical discussions. He says that if there's any just observer, anyone who genuinely is trying to look for the truth, and he sees Islam also has fiqh and Christianity also has fiqh and the other uh, parts, then we're like, okay, what's the difference? Right? Islam has fiqh, Christianity has fiqh. What's the difference? Islam has even mysticism, like Irfan. Okay, Islam has Irfan. Christianity has mysticism. What's the difference? The difference is that in Islam, all of these different parts, they're working efficiently with each other. They're consistent with one another. That's not the case when it comes to the other religions. Right? This, is a very, this is a very important point. If you miss, then you literally have not done justice to inviting people as a whole to Islam or just un even understanding Islam. Islam is not supposed to be understood in different parts. It's supposed to be understood as one body made up of those different parts working efficiently with each other. And then all of a sudden you realize that, snap, this two rak'at of prayers I pray alone in my dark room in the morning, how that is going to end up creating the traits within me to bring about a revolution, right? Two rak'ats alone in your room in the dark. How is that supposed to, what are the long-term and global implications of that act of worship of yours? What's the relation? The beauty of Islam is, is that there is a relation. And we'll go, we'll go on to that in our, in our future nights. We'll see how, how, for example, the main philosophy of Salah is to destroy, is to destroy oneself. Now, there's one thing saying, okay, the philosophy of Salah is to destroy yourself. Okay, I've gotten rid of selflessness. I mean, sorry, I've gotten rid of selfishness. Now what? Right. How is that connected to anything else? This is how it's connected. As soon as you get rid of selfishness, you destroy the barriers between yourself and other people. And brotherhood exists, love exists, true relationships begin to blossom, which, begin, which become the foundation of that teamwork, of that wilaya between one another that's necessary to, for example, uh, bring about true the true form of justice in the world. Right? You see the connection. Right? Unfortunately, what was happening at that time in accordance to um, our Khamnai was that in the explanations of Islam, these connections were not being made. It's like, okay, Islam, spirituality, like don't be greedy, don't be angry, and so on and so forth, and that's it. Like, that's your Islam kind of thing. Okay, hang on a second. Uh, what is our objective? As, Muslim, as humans, what is our objective in this world? Oh, it's to worship, for example, it's to worship Allah, right? How is that connected to this? The reason why I'm stressing that he would say at that time this was the problem is unfortunately a lot of that still exists now. A lot of the discussions, a lot of the problems that he sees and a lot of the understandings that he goes through of the different concepts, it's literally as if he's talking to us right now. Again, this will become more and more apparent as we go along. So what was the first problem that he saw? The first problem was that Islam is not being presented to people as a way of life. It's just something which purely exists in the realm of theory. The second problem that he saw was that Islam is a body made up of different parts working efficiently with each other, but it's being presented as just like these different things which just happen to be under the, under the name of Islam. The third problem that he saw was the distance which was developing between Muslims and the Qur'an. 
So in the explanations of Islam that he saw around him, there was hardly any mention of the Qur'an or relating anything to the Qur'an. And he says like, the problem, there's a, there's a few problems within this. Firstly, if the Qur'an is not being used to explain Islam, what is? Right? He says the first thing that we use is our intellect. The first thing that we use to explain Islam is our intellect. And he says, okay, that's, that's not bad, but it can only get you to an extent. It can only make you understand Islam to an extent. Yes, intellectually, logically, you can reach the conclusion that there is a God. And that God has to be one. There is a wajibul wujud, for example, and he has to be one. right? What about the angels? What about the jinns? And there's a lot of other things within our religion which um, our intellect cannot understand. Right? It can only take us to a certain extent. There's so much to be said about this topic in and of itself, but I don't want to stray from the book too much. But he says that. He says, look, our intellect can only get us to a certain extent of understanding Islam. But we want to understand Islam in its entirety. So why are we relying on this intellect of ours, which is naqis, like it's, it's not complete. It won't get us to what we want to get to. There's a reason why the books were sent down. There's a reason why the prophets were sent down. It's to help us reach the complete understanding of the religion. The other thing he says we rely upon for our understanding of Islam are traditions. So one was the intellect, which is naqis. The other one, the other thing that was being relied upon heavily were traditions. But he says even these traditions, there are only a handful of traditions that we have that we can say with absolute 100% certainty that these were definitely without a shadow of a doubt the words of the Masuri. For a lot of them, yeah, we have itminan. We can reach a certain level of um, assurity that yes, the Ma'asumin would have said this, but to reach that absolute certainty, it's only a handful of traditions. And even in them, we have to look at which ones deal with, the, with understanding Islam itself and not just, for example, a fiqh issue. And then even to, like, to, to just get to that authenticity, which isn't certain, you have to have years of studies behind you with each name that's mentioned in the chain of narrations, for example. You need to do years of research. and So we're looking at that. But what about the Qur'an? The Qur'an, there is no dispute among us whether it's reliable or not. We know word by word the Qur'an is what it is. All the schools of thoughts accept this book, right? And even someone who's not a Muslim, they accept the Qur'an as the holy book of the Muslims. So they're like, okay, do you, like, if you want to know what Muslims actually believe in, we'll go to the Quran. They're not like, oh no, because we don't know which Quran to go to or not. No. Okay, we go to the Quran and we'll try and prove them wrong from the Quran. Why? Because even they know, okay, this is one book. They don't dispute this. They have 100% like certainty upon it. So Al says, okay, why aren't we using this book then to understand? what our religion is. And again, at that time, this was a very, it was almost a, you know, a new, it's a very, it, it was a very revolutionary idea to go back to the Quran, do tafsir of it and understand your religion. Again, what situation do we find ourselves in right now? How close are we to the Quran? As the community, how close are we to the Qur'an? It's beautiful. You guys have, um, you know, the whole room <laughs> dedicated to learning the Qur'an. It's beautiful that a lot of you have taken that step to learn the Qur'an. And inshallah, that proximity continues. There's a story I'm going to throw in over here. Um, so Ayatollah Khamenei was giving a speech to the youth. And he says uh, to them, uh, you know, make use of this time that you have. Uh, especially in gaining proximity to the Qur'an. I've become old now and I've become busy with other things, so it takes me two, three weeks to finish the Qur'an. But when I was at your age, we would finish a Qur'an every three, four days. 
Now, inshallah, we pray that we're able to reach that level where, because it's not just reading it. You, you, there needs to be a love. There needs to be a passion in you to be able to be that committed and that devoted to the Quran. Inshallah, we pray that we also reach that level. And how do you reach that level? It's through this. This whole book, what is it? This whole book is going to help us understand the Quran better. Why? Because it's the Islamic belief system in accordance with the Quran. This is what he says. So he saw these three things missing in the um, explanations of Islam at that time. And he said, okay, do you know what? I need to base it. There's, you can either complain or you can do something about it. Brothers, in activism, in Islamic activism, you're going to come across two people. Two types of people. One of them will be very good at explaining the problem to you. Right? So they'll be standing right next to a mountain and they'll be like, you see this mountain? Such a big mountain. And they'll describe the mountain in the best possible way. They'll give you all the dimensions, the, anything you need to know about the mountain, they'll tell you. And then they'll also stress how we need to get to the top of the mountain. But they'll be standing right next to it. They'll explain to you what the mountain is, how big it is, how we need to climb it. But they'll just stand next to it. There's another group of people that you meet, which you may not even hear. And the reason why you normally don't hear them is whilst you're still standing at the foot of the mountain, they're already halfway up there. Right? They understand the problem, they know the objective, and they actually take steps to try and fulfill it. So it's one thing, okay, there are these three problems in the explanation of Islam. Let's move on to something else now. It's like, no. There's another thing where I say, like, these are three problems that I saw, and as a result of this, I said, there's no choice. I have to like give these speeches. And do you remember the conditions in which these speeches were started? We said, middle of summer, in the month of Ramadan, at a time where everyone likes to sleep in the afternoon, in that, specifically in that culture, he started this. Right? Not because, okay, when can I do it so I have the maximum exposure? No. I have a responsibility to do. This is the only time I can do it. Okay, I'll do it. The rest is in the hands of Allah. And what happened by the end of it? As we said, activists were going around the city, filling up buses, bringing them to the, uh, to the mosque. The people, if you speak to the people who in the end gathered these, they say that these speeches in their eyes single-handedly got the city of Mashhad, the second biggest city in Iran, the city of Imam Radha salam, ready for the revolution. That's not a joke. And it's such a shame that we're not going to actually potentially be able to start the book again today, but just in and of itself, the introduction is worth it. I'll try and, I'll try and get to at least one or two points from the book, just so you can see the sweetness of the discussion. It's a very unique... He has a very unique way of um, going through the verses of the Quran. I don't know if you guys have had the chance to actually listen to his speeches or not. Like literally, the way that the verses roll out of his tongue and how they are, um, um, how they are mixed with the actual explanation of those verses, it's like it's, it's like it's within his nature. Like he doesn't even need to think. That's what it looks like. It's just there right and you'll see why when he was 35 years old if he was explaining these verses like this like okay like now he's <laughs> mashallah he's double that age right he also says that there is a reason why the quran had been relegated to a book which we use to gain thawab for the afterlife, for either ourselves or a loved one has gone to the afterlife and we want to read the Quran for their thawab. Where in our religion, from the time that the Quran was revealed, was it supposed to be a book that is for the afterlife and nothing to do with the life that we have over here? Again, we're repeatedly told the Qur'an is your guide to this life and the next. The Qur'an is the guide to this life and the next. 
But where is it that we've been able to take that out of just being a statement which exists in our minds and actually see the application of it in our day-to-day lives? That's what these, that's what these uh, speeches that he gives will look to do. So, as these speeches begin, they'll do these three things. They'll take out the belief system from our minds and into the practical life. They'll show how it's one body, different parts working efficiently with each other. And everything that is said will be based upon the Quran. Everything that he says is based upon the Quran. The reason why I'm smiling is because I keep remembering some of the points that he says. It's just like, wow, that's, I, I could sit here for 15 minutes just going, wow, and not actually saying anything. But you guys may be slightly annoyed at that, so I won't. Um, there's a quote which he says himself. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, so this is during the talks, he says this, you, my brothers and sisters, must know how to benefit from the Quran in these days. Remember when he's talking about surrounded by darkness, surrounded by problems. The whole environment at that time was polluted, right? Again, I'm saying at that time, you should connect it straight away to this time. Like, see, do we find ourselves in that situation? We feel like the environment around us, it lacks that purity. Like, it lacks that cleanliness, You, my brothers and sisters, must know how to benefit from the Qur'an in these days. Why? There's a tradition of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in which he says, I think the Prophet deserves a better salawat. Please recite aloud the salawat. Prophet said, when seditions and disasters, like the black parts of a dark night, rush upon you, it's only the Quran that will save you. It's only the Quran that will save you. Beautiful slogan. Beautiful, you you can make a really nice banner out of it. What is the practical application and implication of that in our day-to-day lives? That's what these speeches would look to do. Please recite salawat. He himself carries on. He says, when is that night? Right. Again, this is five years before the revolution. When is that night? Do we not see the darkness around us? Have our eyes become so short-sighted that we do not detect it? Do we not see... I'm going to rephrase this sentence. Do we not see the systems which have been made around us to keep us within this darkness, to keep us kind of trapped without us even knowing? Someone once said the worst type of oppression is the one in which you don't know you're oppressed. You don't know you have chains on you and you think you're free and and you even protect those chains thinking that those chains are freedom. Do we not see them Do we not see those systems around us? Then when shall we refer to the Qur'an? When are we supposed to take refuge in the Qur'an, if not now? Brothers, the only solution, the only solution to the problems that we face, regardless of whether they're individual problems or problems in the society around us, the only solution to them is Islam. The only solution to them is Islam. So much to be said. (laughs) Okay, so we do have 15 minutes. um, Six o'clock. Yeah. (laughs) We do have 15 minutes. So what I'm going to do for you guys is I'm going to stop the introduction there. Although there are a couple more points which I could mention, but I think it's nice, especially because unfortunately I won't be here the next two weeks. It would be nice if we, again, get a bit of a taste of what um, the book actually says. Um, The book itself, uh, these speeches, they're split into four parts. So remember, this is the Islamic belief system, or I guess what we would recognize as the usul ad-deen, right? 
How many are the Usuluddin? Anyone? Five? What are they? Yeah, okay. So, Tawheed, Adala, Nabuwa, Imama, and Qiyama. Right. I know why Arash is smiling at this. <laughs> so what does the leader come and do? He says, there are four Usuluddin. Actually, let's rephrase that. There's three Usuluddin that are based upon one. What are they? Tawheed, Nabuwa, Wilaya, and they're based upon Iman, according to the Quran. According to the Quran, three usul din that are based upon one, Iman. Straight away, it's like, hang on a second. <laughs> this isn't what I was taught in Madrasa. Why is this the case? And it's really beautiful. It's a very delicate point, but such a beautiful point. Whenever we want to express our usul, how do we express it? When I want to express my belief in God or that God is one or prophethood or um, the wilaya of Amir al muminin how do I express it? I say, I believe God exists. I believe there is one God. I believe in the messenger. I believe in the wilaya of Amir al-Mu'mineen, for example. Right? What are you saying? I believe. I have iman on this. Do you even know what that means? <laughs> when you say you have iman on these things, do you know what that means? So if you don't know what that means, which is the basis of the expression of your beliefs, then how are you supposed to know the relationship that you're supposed to have with those beliefs? So the section on Iman, it's split into two parts. The first part is um, looking at the virtues of the Mu'mini. Right? So the Mu'minis have these different virtues. The second part is based on the virtues of Iman itself. Right? Virtues of the Mu'mineen, virtues of Iman itself. Why does he do that? The first thing he discusses in the book is Taqwa. So even before Iman, he discusses Taqwa. Why does he do that? Why isn't he giving us dictionary definitions of Taqwa, of Iman? What's interesting about this whole discussion is by the end of taqwa, by the end of tawakkul, by the end of all of these other concepts that we are actually going to do, by the end of iman, not one place has he said iman is equal to this. Tawakkul is equal to this. Taqwa is equal to this. Not one place has he given us a dic dictionary definition. How many times has it been in our school life in general where we've memorized dictionary definitions of different terms, but we have not come closer to the understanding of those terms. Very good example is a mechanic. You can read a hundred books about how to fix a car. You go to a mechanic who may not have even read one book, you just start the car and he knows exactly what's wrong with it. On the other hand, a person who doesn't, who, who does not have that proximity with the car, you can start the car, you can, you can explain to him, look, these are the different parts and stuff. He'll be busy looking in his book. So hang on a second, like, I, I don't actually know what's happening over here. What does the Quran do? Are there dictionary definitions in the Quran? Does the Quran say, taqwa is equal to this? Or does it say, the muttaqeen are those who, so on and so forth. Or even with Iman, for example. It says the mu'mineen are those who, so on and so forth. Why? Because the Quran understands that it's not, Allah understands when he's talking to us, it's not through dictionary definitions that we become closer to these concepts. Rather, it's through experiencing them on a different level, which again we'll get to. Okay, so... The second part on Iman, which talks about the virtues of Iman itself, he says, according to Islam, 
the only iman which has value is the one that's based on understanding. The only iman that has value is the one based on actions and the only iman that has value is that iman which is consistent. It's not pick and choose, it's not in accordance with how I feel today or whether it suits me or not. Right? Why have I jumped that far forward to bring you back? Now when I say I believe in the existence of God, I believe in one God, what am I actually saying? This belief in one God is something that's based on understanding. It's something which permeates through to my words, actions and decisions. And it's something which is consistent. It's not, okay, I believe in him in certain situations and I don't believe him in other situations. So, as we said last week, these discussions began in the month of Ramadan. Right, the holy month of Ramadan. And um, what is one of the objectives of the holy month of Ramadan? Think about the verse in the Quran which specifically speaks of fasting. Anyone? No, not too far off. But. According to the Quran, there's the specific, very famous verse in the Quran about fasting, right? According to that, what's the objective of fasting? Increase our taqwa. What's the verse? Do you remember it? Okay. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyam kama kutiba 'ala alladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqun. Right. So one of the reasons of you fasting is that so you may be among those who have taqwa. So I asked my teacher, why is it that, okay, the first section is on Iman, but he starts off the discussion with Taqwa. And he gave this reason. It's the beginning of the month of Ramadan. One of the objectives of the month of Ramadan is to attain Taqwa. Therefore, he begins his discussion with this. And also, um, the second verse of Surah Baqarah. Anyone know it? I'll give you a clue, it's after Alif Lam Meem. ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِيهُ هُدَلِّ الْمُتَّقِينَ How beautiful is it that we're about to start a book which is going to bring us closer to Islam through the Qur'an and as this verse says, the Qur'an is what? It's a book of guidance for who? The muttaqin. Okay, so let's understand taqwa first. Right? Once we've understood taqwa, then we'll... Go ahead and have a look at the book. So, what is taqwa? Even the start of the discussion that he has, it shows that, okay, like this is interesting. I want you guys to actually note this down if you can. The verses that he will be looking at are from Surah Ali Imran, verses 130 to 134. Verses 130 to 134. We'll be going through these at least in the next session. But we'll start on it today. So the end of verse 130, what does it say? Oh, Surah Ali Amran. So hang on a second. It says... Be wary of Allah or be God conscious or however you want to translate taqwa itself. Be pious. Be wary of Allah so that you may be among the victorious. Hang on a second. What does being God conscious and having taqwa, being pious, have to do with being victorious? And this is how he approaches it. It's like, okay, well, when the question was raised to the divine religions, 
How will you help your people avoid sins? Different religions responded in different ways. I should say that not the religions themselves, but the people who followed those religions um, followed it uh, or tried to find a solution in different ways. One of the ways Christians tried to find a solution to how to avoid sins is through something known as monasticism, right? which is the practice of detaching yourself completely from the society, going up halfway up a mountain, living the rest of your life over there so that you can avoid falling into sin. Right? How do you avoid sins? By not putting yourself in a position where there's even a chance for you sinning. Right? That was the response that the Christians had. And the Quran deals with it. In Surah Hadid, verse number 27. Sorry, I thought I didn't write down the source for a second. Only seeking Allah's pleasure. So this is talking about the Christians. Like, Why did they do monasticism? Their intentions weren't bad. So they still carried it out because they wanted to avoid sins. But if you look at the beginning of the verse, it says, we put kindness and mercy into the hearts of those who followed him, talking about Hazrat Isa. But as for monasticism, they innovated it. We had not prescribed it for them. So it was something which, it was a solution which they came out themselves. The divinely inspired Christianity does not have this concept. It was something which was inspired by them. It was a solution which they came up with for this specific problem. right? But then the verse carries on. Yet they did not observe it with due observance, so we gave to the faithful among them the due reward, but many of them are transgressors. What does this mean? It means they wanted to avoid drowning, so they found a house really far away from water, and then they ended up drowning in the bathtub. This is what happened to them, right? But when you look at Islam, like when Islam was presented with, okay, provide a solution for us avoiding sins, there's a slight dilemma here. If you look at the stress Islam puts on the relationship that you need to have with, firstly, yourself, secondly, with those around you, with the society around you, even with the vegetation and stuff around you, you get put in a slight dilemma. It's like, hang on a second. How am I supposed to, on one side, live in the middle of society and on the other side, avoid sins the way that they had presented a solution? It doesn't seem to jam. Not only are you supposed to be healthy according to Islam, but you're supposed to help those that are sick. Not only are you supposed to be rich and wealthy, you're supposed to help those that are poor. Not only are you supposed to learn how to swim, but you help those that are drowning. That's what Islam teaches you to do. Right? So when it comes to finding a solution for avoiding sin, what can we do? Very quickly, Ahamna uses the example of an armor. He says, taqwa is like an armor. Again, there's no dictionary definition. He gives an example. Taqwa is like an armor. Now imagine, back in those days, if you wore an armor, like heavy metal, like you've seen it, like you need like another person to help you put it on and take it off, and all those metal plates and stuff. Imagine you spent like an hour wearing that, and then... You sit at home and do nothing. So you spend the whole day at home wearing that heavy armor on you. Does that make any sense? No. Taqwa is like an armor. You wear it to protect yourself so you can go in the middle of the battlefield and help others. That's what taqwa is described as. That's what the likeness of taqwa is given to. And all of a sudden, what happens? We go back to where we started the verse, the end of the verse. Now that you're talking about taqwa being an armor that you wear in the middle of a battlefield in which you're supposed to help others, now you understand how you can have taqwa and you can be victorious. Because victory makes sense when there's a battle. Victory does not make sense when your solution to avoiding sins is running away from the battle. Now it makes sense why Allah uses tuflihun, why he uses victory as um, 
the sifa or characteristic to describe those who have taqwa. So inshallah in the next few sessions we'll be going through these three, four verses which mention the different virtues of the muttaqeen. And again, have a look yourselves. Have a look at these verses. You'll be like, okay, we've heard this a hundred times. Like we've heard these same concepts a hundred times. And I can promise you that you have not heard this explanation of these concepts. I can guarantee you that. We finish uh, today's session with a du'a. We pray to Allah that he accepts whatever was said and heard. Um, the sincere efforts of all the brothers uh, and sisters involved in making this happen. Uh, we pray that, again, whatever is heard and said is used to gain proximity to him, is used to gain proximity to the Ahlul Bayt. And as a reminder, the second point that I mentioned last week was we need to continuously renew our intention. We need to remind ourselves of why we are here. We are here because we refuse to be those who just sit aside whilst the religion of Allah, the mission of the Ahl Bayt, the campaign of the final Imam, like becomes victorious. No, we want to be tools. We want to be among those that help it happen. That's why we come over here. Because we understand the first place that's going to start is from here. And what more beautiful way to do it than through understanding the Islamic belief system from scratch, from the Quran itself. Again, for the hastening of the reappearance of our beloved Imam, please recite aloud salawat. <laughs>